Good evening. Um, previous cometry missions have uh, provided us with fantastic close-up views of the comets that they've flown by, but these have been very fast flybys that have given us essentially just a snapshot of those comets. And trying to figure out what's going on in the comet is, is imagine um, trying to figure out the uh, contents of a film by looking at a poster outside a cinema. Okay, you need to be able to be there for a period of time in order to see how a comet evolves. And that's the strength of the Rosetta mission. It was designed to go to the comet and not just fly past, but to orbit the object and produce those fantastic images that we've seen of the whole object for the first time ever, um, and also um, to be able to watch it as it evolves. The mission is still going on and it will continue to go on throughout the year, observing the comet as the activity builds up and it approaches the sun. So this allows us to address a number of questions about how comets work, and I've just uh, listed a few here. So first of all, how, how, what's the structure of a comet? We've seen this really crusty, solid surface, and yet we know the density is incredibly low. Is that low density a result of a uniform, low-density aggregate of small particles that, that essentially built up from the primordial material in the solar system? Or is it something which actually has higher density pieces, but with voids between them, um, which may have, for example, come about by collisions, breaking up bodies, and then re-aggregating them again. Okay, and those two different structures will indicate very different histories from the comet, but uh, externally they may look the same. Next question is, is, what's the nature of the activity? How is that gas coming off the surface? When we don't really see very much ice on the surface, and yet we know it's ice that's vaporizing. So is it small icy patches? Is it uh, holes in the surface from which the ice is vaporizing underneath and escaping out through cavities, like the one you saw a few minutes ago? Or is it just vaporization from uh, ice uh, below the surface and basically filtering up through the porous crust? Okay, or any combination of these things. And this is very hard to see from, from orbit. As that ice vaporizes, it carries away dust particles with it. That's what gives us the scattered light in, and makes the coma visible. Uh, but what's the nature of that dust? Is it high density, uh, high temperature minerals that form close to the sun in that rocky region that again got transported out and deposited where in the ices that where the comet um, was made? Or is it something that predates that? This what we might regard as a sort of fluffy, low density aggregates of interstellar grains the kind of picture on the right-hand side that we expect grains to be out in interstellar space right from the beginning of the cell system's formation and therefore predating it. So um, that final question is what the instrument that I've been involved with is trying to measure. It's called Giada, and it measures the properties of dust. And because the spacecraft is traveling slowly around the comet, it gives us for the first time the opportunity to measure the speed of the dust grains. As the dust grains actually enter the instruments like a box, they pass through a laser curtain, cause a flash which you detect and then the particle hits the target underneath and you measure the momentum and from the timing between the two you can get the speed, you can get the size from the light flash and you get the mass from the momentum transfer when you hit the target and that means you can work out the density of the dust grains. And uh, on the right hand side you can see the red dots are where we've detected dust grains around the green orbits around the comet, the comet's the blue bit in the center um, and you can see we're detecting dust particles all around. This is just the very very first few uh, detections. We've got many hundreds now, but I can't talk about all those. Um, but what we've found already is that there are both classes of particles are present. So we've seen high density compact grains, but we've also seen very, very fluffy low density grains, um, and they arrive in clusters, probably broken up by some interaction with the spacecraft. The other interesting thing we found is that actually there's far more dust than there is gas. So this classical picture of a comet as being a sort of dirty snowball, um, it's actually the wrong way around, okay? It's mostly dirt with a bit of snow. Um, and this, these observations have been confirmed by an instrument called COSIMA. Um, it's probably quite difficult for you to, to see there, but inside the red square, there are two little dots, and they're magnified a bit on the right-hand side, the before and after pictures, so you know that they weren't there when the mission started. And these are compact grains. In the bottom, uh, they're about a tenth of a millimeter in size at the bottom, comparable to what we are detecting with Giada. At the bottom, you're seeing these larger, fluffy grains, and in fact, these are so structurally weak that they basically collapse um, when they hit the target. Um, this instrument is now making measurements of the composition of these grains, but uh, I can't tell you what that is because it's data's embargoed, I'm afraid. 
Now, these are measurements made in the coma of the comet, but they don't allow you to study what's actually happening at the surface. And what you really want to do is get down at the surface and find out what's really going on. And, of course, that's the other unique part of the Rosetta mission. It had the Philae lander. And you can see here a sequence of images which actually show the lander in its transfer down to the surface. And you can see there were several images which actually captured the lander in the foreground. Up near the top of the image is the landing site where the lander very briefly uh, arrived within a few meters of its, its targeted position, but unfortunately it didn't stay there. It bounced off in the incredibly low gravity of this, this object and then headed off to the right. And right in the top right-hand corner, you can see it silhouetted above a dark region, flying off to the right-hand side. And so here's uh, X marks the spot of where we were supposed to be, and the arrow shows the direction it went in, uh, disappearing over the horizon. Again, inside the little uh, markers on the right-hand side, you probably can't see there's a little white dot, which is Philae disappearing over the horizon. Um, but we know, of course, it did land again. Um, we just don't know precisely where. Um, the red, red um, ellipse there shows you the region where we think it is. And this has been derived from another instrument called CONCERT, which measures ra sig radio signals transmitted through the comet. So using the shape model of the comet from the images and the signal making an assumption that the, uniform, the, the comet is uniform in density allows you to work out the length of the signal through the comet. And therefore, as the spacecraft, sorry, on the main spacecraft, as it moves behind, you can then work out the track. And so you can then predict where you think the lander has, has arrived, and that's inside that little blue area there. So that gives us a search region in which to look for the spacecraft. Once we find it, we can then work backwards and say, now we know precisely where it went. We can then look in those signals for deviations from a uniform density to try and figure out what the internal structure of the comet is. So that's a sort of wait for uh, event. Of course, the first view from the surface already told us something fantastic that we didn't see this crust of, of what we were expecting to see, a sort of smooth, dusty layer. We saw something that looks very much like rock. In fact, it's almost certainly ice, um, a solid ice um, and with very little material on it. But it came apparent almost straight away from the position of the foot in the bottom left-hand corner there um, that the spacecraft wasn't orientated correctly, standing on its feet. Um, and we can see... Um, how the spacecraft is orientated by using the six cameras that each were on different sides of the, of the lander looking out. And you realize one of those cameras is pointing up at the sky. That's the one at the top. The one on the right and the one on the far left uh, were clearly looking at, at rocky surfaces, but one of them is in shadow. And then uh, below, you're looking at surfaces much closer to the spacecraft. And so the base of the spacecraft is pointing to the one that's at about 8 o'clock. And that is the direction in which the samplers that were going to make measurements on the surface would be taking their measurements. And that brings me to the second experiment that uh, we've been involved with at the Open University. And this is called MUPUS, which is measuring physical properties of the surface. And it has three sensors in it, um, three systems in it. The first of those are temperature sensors, which were on the harpoons. And... Many of you may remember that these harpoons, which were supposed to anchor the comet, the, the spacecraft to the comet, didn't work. They didn't fire. Um, they probably wouldn't have worked anyway, as it turns out, if the comet is as hard as we think it is. Um, but unfortunately, it means the temperature sensors they were carrying couldn't work either. Fortunately, we also had a thermal imager on the base of the spacecraft, which took an image of that uh, region, and it measured a temperature of minus 160 degrees C. So this is much, much colder than the temperature that which ice sublimates in a vacuum, which is about minus 90. So that wall could be solid ice. It's just at the moment too cold to vaporize. It may well be doing now uh, or in the future as the comet comes close to the sun, and that will get very exciting. Um, the third system is on an arm, and it has a little hammer, which hammers its way into the surface, and, it, and as it does so, it measures the strength of the material, and then it deploys temperature sensors to measure the temperature profile down into the body to see whether you can vaporize ices below the surface. Um, and we wasn't sure whether this would actually reach the surface or not, because we didn't know how far away it was from the base, but it did. It reached something that was very th relatively soft. It went in about 20 centimeters, and we sort of interpret that as being a, a dusty, insulating layer. And then it hit something hard, which, again, we assume is ice. 
much like the wall on the right hand side um, and that was so hard that the, camera, the hammer couldn't penetrate it and so we don't have any measurements from inside but that's a useful piece of information because it tells us it puts a limit on how hard the surface is and the, the uh, experiments now are going on to see how hard ice has to be for that hammer not to get through it okay and that will uh, help us understand what the structure is uh, on the surface now we've been doing experiments to understand how ices vaporize and complex mixtures of ices and dust um, and if you, you put them together and expose them to the sort of conditions you have on a comet to see if you can make that kind of insulating crust and you can make a hard layer that we that we see on the comet now and initially when we did this we collected our snow very kindly donated by a snow zone and then mixed it up with other stuff um, you'd be you, th you wonder, actually, be surprised whether there could be terrestrial applications from this kind of blue skies research. But strangely enough, the sensors that we designed to make the measurements of the structure of the materials that we were making are of great interest to people who make snow. And companies who make snow, such as the one uh, in Italy, uh, shown with their snow-making uh, instrument on the right-hand side, um, are very interested in how they can control the snow they make. And this company who produces um, systems to make snow for a lot of the uh, ski resorts in Europe were very interested in our techniques. We've had our first uh, meeting with them to, to discuss it. Um, but later on you'll hear a bit more um, about uh, many applications that have come from the work we've done on comets. Yeah.